Good morning. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Hope you all had a good, uh, a good time with your family. Uh, I was a part of that controlled chaos that Derek was talking about, and it was great fun, and uh, all the grandkids have gone home, and that's great too. <laughs> I love the noise, and I love the quiet afterwards, so... <laughs> You know, like probably most pastors, uh, you know, this is sort of the introductory Sunday of a new year. And personally, I don't, you know, make a big deal out of uh, the new year. But hey, it's as good a time as any to kind of take a fresh look at our lives and, and look at some area of our life that maybe needs tuning up or completely overhauled or what have you. Because, you know, we should be in the process of becoming more and more like Christ in the process of changing and that sort of thing. And I kind of like the idea of, uh, hey, why not start the year off with something that has real impact, that has real change. And I was thinking about this whole subject of attitude. I'm sure you guys know like I know that when you meet somebody who's just got a right attitude, you know, they're just positive and they're enthusiastic and they're engaging and, uh, and uh, kind and considerate. I mean, that kind of attitude is like contagious, right? You enjoy being with that person. You look forward to being with that person more in the future. And then we've also met the other person who, man, I mean, their attitude just is stinky, you know? I mean, they're just negative, and they're grouchy, and they're critical, and they're irritable. And honestly, man, you're like, okay, how long do I have to stay in this environment to be polite before I can exit? And then you make note that when they call again, it's like, boy, I'm really not available. You know what I mean? So attitude really is huge. One of my favorite quotes is by Chuck Swindoll. It's in your uh, bulletin. I just thought, boy, I'm going to give that to you. And you would do well to cut that out, put that on your refrigerator, and look at it, as I do. I mean, that's been around for decades. And I'm not kidding. I probably read that thing at least 10, 20 times a year because it is just so spot on. I like what he said about attitude. Swindoll says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude, to me, is more important than facts. It is more important than the past than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we embrace for the day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. And I love this statement. I totally believe this. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. Don't you love that? And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. And so in this series, we're going to talk about attitude. And for eight weeks, we're going to be looking at one single verse. I've never done that before where we just have one verse that covers an eight-week span. But I promise you, as we unpack this, you'll realize why it takes as many weeks as it does to thoroughly understand what it is that is said in this passage. And so it's based on what the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, the, ch the church in Philippi. And he wrote this. He said, finally, brothers... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so each of these statements are what we're going to be taking a look at in these uh, weeks together. He gives eight ways of thinking about things that really become the foundation of Christian thinking, of Christian attitudes. Paul challenges us to develop our attitudes along these eight concepts of thinking. Now, it's been my observation over the years, the tendency that with most people, even Christians, that we either lean in the direction of being overly negative about life and life's circumstances or to be overly positive about life and life circumstance. In other words, the way I like to put this is this, that most people are not balanced regarding a known reality. And I'll, I'll explain that term to you here in a moment. That people think that they're balanced, but in reality, I, 
Well, I tell you what, I, I, I have a litmus test for you to know if you are overly negative or overly positive. And the lit, litmus test, it's reliable and it's predictable, it's accurate. And it basically is this, that our initial reaction to potential bad news in a crucial area of our life, not the, not the processed way you think about bad news, I'm talking about the initial reaction. Is my initial reaction like, hey, it'll all work out, and that would be Colleen's. Just, it'll all work out. That's her mantra in my life. I tend to be more of the negative, like, oh, man, it's over. We're done with. <laughs> but that is, you know, whatever you think about yourself, this is where you really need to be examining that what is that initial reaction to bad news? I don't know of any other way to, uh, to know what your real attitude about, about it is. So when serious trouble knocks on your door, you know, like you know, the doctor sees something on a mammogram or PSA count is a little bit high and they want to have you come back and do a biopsy, you know, uh, some of us, we immediately go to the worst case scenario. Like, you know, my days are over. It's over. I won't see my kids or my grandkids grow up. Uh, you know, my, my life has been cut short. I better get my, my, my affairs in order because I don't have much time. I mean, that's just kind of where we go to with bad news. And then again, others, they go the opposite direction, you know. Hey, there's no way it could be cancer. Uh, you know, uh, I know that the results are going to be good. I've, I've been walking in God's favor my whole life. Cancer has no authority in my body and uh, you know I've rebuked it I've bound it on earth I've loosed the healing in heaven etc etc you know that's how some people view the bad news or how about this situation you've been working for a company for a number of years you have a certain amount of uh, you know seniority in that company but you learn that it's now going to be merging with another company and you know that whenever mergers take place in business that usually means middle management is going to be cut out and you happen to be a middle management guy or gal in the company Again, you know, some are going to assume that their neck is on the chopping block. I mean, they're already reworking their resume before they even get off their shift, you know. They're making applications elsewhere. They've contacted a re real estate agent to sell their house. They're going to sell their car. They're looking for an adoptive home to take their kids. I mean, they fully expect that their job is the one of the positions that's going to be eliminated. And then others are thinking, boy, there's no way they would let me go. I have assets around here. I'm a valuable part of the team here. I've got experience. I'm as productive as anybody. And they sleep like a baby. They just know that they're going to be okay. Now, listen, I don't think anyone here, as I know you, is a poster child of extreme, either ultra-negative or ultra-positive. But I also know you, Living Hope, that you're probably like me, where there is a certain area of your life where you are prone to extremes. Not across the board, it's just that certain area. It could be regarding health issues, it could be regarding your children, your adult children, your finance, whatever. We've all kind of got that one area. And so the passage today is going to challenge us to achieve a better balance in this thing that I call, you know, known reality. And what I mean by known reality is this, that we've got to live and think in the light of reality, both transcendent and personal reality. Transcendent and personal. I'll come back to that in a moment. But for now, I just want to bring you back to our passage. It says, finally, brothers, whatsoever is true, think about these things. That is the first thinking pattern, concept, the idea behind a Christian thought life and attitude is to think about things that are true. Now, the Greek word for that word true is aletheis. It means to unhide. Aletheis means to unconceal. It has the idea of disclosing what really is. It's usually used in the context of accurately compre comprehending something that you might find in a document. So you get a letter, you get a, you get a note, uh, an email. Uh, Alithes is the idea of I accurately understand what's being communicated. I've opened the email, it's unveiled, it's unconcealed, and I accurately comprehend and perceive what's happening. It can also accurately comprehend the meaning of just a personal experience. It doesn't have to be a document. It could be just a personal experience. Go through some kind of life experience. Alithes is to think about what's true. 
that my personal experience has right ways, truthful ways of thinking about it, and then other ways of thinking about it that would be, you know, make you scratch your head and go, what? That's what you're walking away with from that experience? And so it holds the idea that as New Testament Christ followers, we should think about life and life's experiences according to what's true, according to what's real, what's honest, unveiled, seen for what it really is. And when you study this word aletheis, the Greek word for true, it applies both to transcendent truth and to personal truth. So let me tell you a little bit about those two terms And listen, I have to forewarn you, this is going to be, you know, a little bit of heady stuff, and I don't like, you know, getting super complicated and super scholastic-like. I know I tend to get bored with that, and I suspect that you do. Trust me, I put a lot of time into making this as simple as I could, and it's not quite simple. So I've instructed my ushers, we have extra ADD medication for all of you that struggle with, with focus and concentration. Yep, we can pass those out liberally for you. I need you to hold on to your comprehension and your focus Bear with me. Will you do that? I've I've just given you a forewarning, okay? So, transcendent truth. Let's talk about that. It's defined by theologians as truth that's unaffected by space and time. It's truth that is above us and outside of us. It's that which surpasses what the normal human mind can comprehend. It's truth that actually surpasses what the normal human body could actually do or achieve. It's a truth that's out there to be discovered or revealed, this transcendent truth to be discovered or revealed. It's truth that's not affected by time or space. It's truth that is unchanging. If you don't remember anything else, hold on to that one. Truth that is unchanging unchanging truth. In other words, transcendent truth is true. Whether we recognize it or not, whether we've studied it or not, whether we've talked about it or not, it's true whether we believe it or not. It remains true. It's always been true. It's truth that is unchanging. And so in Christian theology, most of this transcendent truth is about God and truth that comes from God, primarily about himself. Most of the transcendent truth that you see in Scripture, the use of this word aletheis, is about God, that God has said about himself. And our God is an unchanging God. Everything he says about himself has always been true, is currently true, always will be true. You'll never hear God the Father saying, you know, there's a time when I thought this way, but then I grew up and I realized, hmm, and now it's more like this. That's not a part of God's makeup. Our makeup, yes, never God's makeup. And there's lots of examples about this. I mean, this is truth that comes from a Trinitarian God. It's revealed in the scripture that when applied to our lives, it has a transforming power to change us. But that is the reality about transcendent truth, is that if it never gets applied, then you're never really going to experience its truth. Lots of examples about transcendent truth. I mean, the very existence and reality of God is a transcendent truth. The goodness of God is a transcendent truth. The unchanging and sovereign nature of God. The fallenness of mankind is is a... a, uh, transcendent truth. The mercy and forgiveness of God towards man in that fallenness is a transcendent truth. These transcendent truths for Christians, they really are the solid bedrock. They are the firm foundation, this unchanging truth that we build our lives upon. And the reason why this is so important to us is that because this word aletheis is used many times in the New Testament just that way, as a transcendent truth. So, for example, let me just give you a couple of examples here. There is a point in Jesus' ministry when, when he was telling people that, they, that he, I, Jesus, am the light of the world. Remember that story? And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He makes that statement. And there's Pharisees, as usual, in the group, Jesus' critics, the ones who are always trying to tear him down and disqualify him. And so they uh, fire back at him and say basically to him, hey, Jesus, just because you say that you're the light of the world and that if, follow, if people follow you that they will walk in the light of life, just because you say that doesn't make it so. It doesn't make it true. And here's how Jesus responded to that. He said, even if... If I do bear witness about myself, uh, my testimony is true. 
For I know where I came from and where I am going. In other words, like saying, hey, you know what? I could not say what I just said, and it still remains true because that's the nature of transcendent truth. I'll give you another example. Remember uh, when Peter uh, wrote a letter, he was talking to believers who were struggling and suffering, and he writes this in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter. He says, The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while. So he's talking to a group of people who have been going through tough times, far tougher than anything you and I go through. Now, after you've suffered a little while, this God of grace himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And then verse 12, he says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. This is the alethes of God, the true grace of God. He's saying even though we suffer, the grace of God in the end will make us strong, firm, steadfast. In other words, hey, you're going through it. You're going through the tough times. Let your attitudes be grounded. Let your attitude be steadfast. Let your, uh, in the knowledge, the truth, the alethes, that God will restore you in such a way that you'll be better off for having gone through all of the suffering and hardship that you went through. Which is why we want to be students of God's word, living our lives in this transcendent truth, living our lives in God's truth. Now, I think most of us are familiar with this passage out of Isaiah that says, uh, <clears throat> For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. How many of you are familiar with that passage? You know, we've all seen that before. We all know this, that God's truth exists outside of time and space and is oftentimes different than our truth. But I think where the controversy comes in, where people struggle, it's in the second use of this word true or aletheis. These are the truths that occur within space and time. Again, I know a little bit heady. Hang with me. Okay, I, I promise we'll get to a point where, where we get to the who cares, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually, okay? So, uh, Truths that occur within time and space, or what we might call personal truth, which is really just defined as the truth of one's personal experience. These are truths that are not absolute, like transcendent truths are. These are truths that are not unchanging, like transcendent truths are. These are truths that are, true, uh, that are not true outside of space and time, and yet they are true nevertheless. And when you do a word study of this word true in the New Testament, you know, what you find are most of the passages refer to transcendent truth. Most of them. But there are a few passages where the use of this word alethes is in the context of a personal truth, not a transcendent truth. For example, remember the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well? Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come back here. The woman, uh, and, and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, uh, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true, is alethes. The question is, is the fact that this woman had five hus husbands, is that transcendent? Of course not. It was true for her. It was true in her experience. A personal truth trapped in her space, trapped in her time, true in her experience. I'll give you another example of alethes, this saying true related to a personal truth, not a transcendent truth. Peter was sprung from prison one time, and the story goes like this. The angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. 
He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. There's our aliface word again, which is part of the word of definition of what's true. It's reality. But the angel was real, but thought he was actually seeing a vision. And so Peter's being sprung from prison here, doubting whether his experience was real or true. But in fact, it was true. It was aliphase. And so the point is that the Bible uses this word for truth, both in a transcendent way and in a personal truth way. And I think the key difference is this, between transcendent truth and personal truth, is that all transcendent truth is reality. But not all perceived or stated personal truth is necessarily reality. All Transcendent truth is real. It's always real. On the other hand, what we believe or voice to be our personal truth may or may not be real. I could tell you also just a couple things I want to mention about this thing of personal truth, some things that you should know about this. And really, these three statements I'm going to mention, only one of them could possibly be true at any given time. And, you know, and all of our personal truth will fall into one of these three statements. So number one, our personal truth could be real or true for a selected time and space. It could be true. It could be alithes. It could be real. This was the case for the woman at the well. It's true. She had five husbands. And we all have uh, uh, personal truth that's true for us indeed because it's our personal experience. If I say I drive a 1992 Chevy pickup truck with high mileage, worn interior, ample rust on the exterior, that is true. That is true in my space and time, but it's not an unchanging truth. There was a time where I didn't own that truck. There's a time where I owned the truck, but it wasn't disintegrating. <laughs> and most likely there'll be a time where I won't own that truck. It's not an unchanging truth. The second possibility of our personal truth, number two, is that our personal truth could be perceptually true, but not really true. In other words, we think it's true, it seems true, but in reality, it's not. We go back to Peter's experience. He did experience being rescued, but he didn't realize it was real. He thought he was having a vision. He thought of it incorrectly. The way he thought of it wasn't really true. So if I go back to another example of, you know, like my truck, if I, if I added to the description of my truck, which is, you know, present truth for me, it's true, I own the 92 disintegrating truck. If I go back to that and I add to my perception and that it's the best truck out there in the parking lot. You know, really, those of you who have seen my, ch my truck would challenge that truth. Because the real truth is, it's the worst truck in the parking lot, except for Josh's. <laughs> and my observation is that we all do this a lot. You know, we hold certain truths to be true. Everyone around us knows better, but we're certain that we have got the corner on what's true and what's right. You know, in the Tuggle marriage, when Colleen and I view things differently, which is like pretty much 99.9% .9 of everything, we do these little $20 bet on who is right. How, what would you say I probably have paid you in... in yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like I said, I think we do this a lot, where we think something is true, but in reality, it's not true. I think that's true. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm oftentimes preaching to myself, believe me. And this is no exception. <laughs> in our culture, I see this taking place as well, that personal truth could be perceptually true, but not really true. 
we definitely live in a post-Christian era where there really is no longer any confidence or belief in a transcendent truth or what is usually referred to in the media as absolutes. You know, truth is to each his own, whatever you declare your truth to be, that's good enough for me because there is no standard of real truth. Another way of saying that is that there is no transcendent truth, so now everybody's just left with their personal truth and that's supposed to be honored. That's what culture says today. And that's why culture really doesn't stand firm on things like marriage between a man and a woman. Sorry, not my idea. If you're angry about this, get angry with the mess. I'm just the messenger carrying the message that a transcendent truth is that God actually made men and women. And that was the context of this thing called marriage between men and women. Another transcendent truth is that when God created human beings, very clearly transcendent truth, it's always been this way, it will always continue to be this way, that he made them with male and female genders, that God assigns gender. And so we're now living in a culture where I guess, you know, around six or seven, you're smart enough, old enough, mature enough to know what your gender should be, and whatever you choose, go for it. <laughs> Contrary to transcendent truth. transcendent truth that children become children at conception. Again, not my idea. But honestly, my personal truth around that, your personal truth, you know, I think the healthy outlook is, who gives a rip? You know, my opinion doesn't really matter much, nor does yours. Especially when there is a transcendent truth on this that God has spoken, hey, at the moment of conception, we are now having a, we are now uh, addressing a, a living human being. So again, culture, uh, you know, perceptually true, but not really true. Oh my goodness, this is the culture we live in. Number three about personal truth is that our personal truth could be an experienced transcendent truth. In other words, we have an experience and we came to to believe it something as true, perhaps some kind of a personal truth, and then later realize that it was God revealing his nature to us. I've had this so many experiences where, you know, at a time when I was doubting and a time when I was confused, I was questioning my faith, I was questioning the things of God, and God just came to me and touched my heart and reminded me of who he is and his faithfulness. And I look back at those times and I realize that was a transcendent truth that was being communicated to me. I've had a couple of experiences back when I was younger and like most young families, uh, you know, things were really, really tight financially and there was always more month than money at the end of the month and, uh, you know, miracle checks that came in, sometimes to the penny. I've had a couple of experiences like that. I've had a couple of experiences where I'm driving down the road, transcendent truth, and I just have this strong inner sense of move over to the shoulder. And sure enough, I do that, and then oncoming traffic coming my way. And uh, had I not moved over, it would have been a head-on collu- collision. You know what I'm talking about? Have you had encounters like this with God? This is what we're talking about here uh, in, this, in this third point. Our personal truth is actually an experienced transcendent truth where we experience something. Usually the response to this is, God, you're so good. God, you're so faithful, which happen to be transcendent truths about God. He's good and he's faithful. So transcendent truth can become personal truth so that we can experience God, which he wants us to experience him, but not every personal truth is transcendent in nature. So now we get to the so what. Why is not understanding this so important? Why is it understanding the distinction between transcendent truth and personal truth in our hearts and minds? Why would that be important? How does this really affect our attitude? So I come back to this point of known reality and the idea of it that we must live and think in light of known reality, both transcendent and personal reality. 
That's why it's so important that if we hope to live our lives well, we have to have an understanding of the two and be able to recognize which truth it is that we're experiencing. Because if we don't, we will be in trouble in our attitudes. That's what Paul meant when he said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, think about these things things. And so to be oriented toward truth, towards alethes, we must be mindful of both transcendent truth and personal truth. And when we do that with Holy Spirit assistance, we have three very profound benefits that explains the importance, the importance of living in known reality, which again, known reality is just both transcendent and personal truths. So benefits of living in known reality. Number one, it grounds us in wisdom. The best definition I can give you about wisdom is that it's the ability to zoom out and look at any circumstance and situation from the broadest possible perspective. Rarely does decision making go good when you're just looking at one little piece of the situation of the dilemma, almost like under a microscope, and you've never zoomed out to look at the big picture. What's the big picture? Really, it's as big as, well, you know, my, my favorite wisdom question. When I face dilemmas, I think of the wisdom question, which is, in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do? I have to look at past, present, and future. That's a broad perspective, but that's what wisdom requires of us. And so the tendency is for most of us to either immerse ourselves in personal truth while ignoring transcendent truth or to go the other direction where we just ignore and deny and minimize personal truth. And that is a problem, although some might say that that's controversial. As Christ followers, Barry, shouldn't all we be concerned about is transcendent truth and who cares about personal truth? I'm thinking, no, I think God gave us a brain that he wants us to use. He wants us to think things through. He wants us to use our minds and our hands and our feet to take care of business. I mean, for example, you have a teen child and you've noticed this kid who was, you know, pretty good student, pretty good attitude, pretty good young man. And then all of a sudden, he gets into, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade, his grades start to tank, his attitude starts to tank, he comes straight home, locks himself in the room, you know, you could tell he's just making bad choices with, uh, you know, with alcohol and with drugs, and there's evidence of some depression going on, maybe even some suicidal tendencies, some cutting maybe, or, you know, that kind of thing. And I've actually seen parents who dismissed all of that personal truth as, well, isn't that just kind of what teens do? I'm like, what world are you living on? No, that's not what normal, regular teens do. I mean, I did that, but normal, regular teens don't behave that way. And they never really took the time because they never addressed their personal truth on this subject. They never took the time to seek counsel, to develop a treatment plan, to set maybe some limits and boundaries, to get some help, to maybe examine what's going on in the family, some family dynamics. They never considered a medical explanation, the social life of this kid, spiritual realities that take place. Nope, they used denial, minimization. They stuck their heads in the sand and hoped for the best. And I propose to you that that is unwise you better listen to your personal truth. And then you can talk to another family, same scenario with their kid. And they did do all of those things. They did take their kid to counseling. They did have a treatment plan. They set some boundaries. They looked at the family junk going on. They took their kid to the doctor, got them going maybe on some antidepressant medication, started bringing them to a youth group and and getting them some help and all of that. sort. They did all of that. But they ignored transcendent truth. Because how many of you know, maybe you've lived it, and you certainly know someone who did all of those things and it didn't get better. How many of you know that after you've done all that you can do, sometimes what you've done is not enough? Correct? It's just not enough. And so how wonderful it is to appeal to this God who loves us, who says, listen, my resources are unlimited. With me, there's nothing that's impossible. It is a big mistake, unwise to ignore transcendent truth. You need both personal truth and transcendent truth. Secondly, 
benefits of living in known reality is that it fosters balance. It keeps us from becoming depressingly negative or dangerously positive. I thought about maybe putting that as the number two instead of fosters balance that keeps us from becoming depressingly negative or dangerously positive. Actually, the first way I thought about it was uh, becoming depressingly negative or nauseatingly positive. <laughs> but then I didn't know how to spell nauseatingly, and I figured you didn't either. So I just went with Foster's balance. Acknowledge both personal truth, transcendent truth that keeps us in balance. Like I said, it mentioned earlier that we have this tendency as Christians especially to become either overly fatalistic or overly idealistic in our viewpoint, especially when we're facing bad news. So think about a person who gets bad news, maybe a diagnosis with cancer. The fatalistic person raises the white flag not even going to fight. But the truth is, many do win the battle against cancer. Can I get an amen? Many win that battle. And I've talked to many surviving family members who struggle with resentment because of a loved one who would not engage in the battle and their years were cut short. Good grief, you know. If you get diagnosed with cancer, my thought is you fight for life. If not for your sake, how about just for your kids' sake and your grandkids' sake? That's the fatalistic person, though. They don't fight. And then on the other hand, the idealistic person makes no room for the possibility that they may die. The idealistic person just isn't going to go to that place. And should that prove to be the case that they are going to die, they're usually unprepared. They didn't get their house in order. They didn't say their goodbyes. They didn't make amends to loved ones. They didn't say the things that needed to be said. I mean, I have a friend who, her husband died of cancer uh, many years ago. And he knew in his heart, this is a godly man, but he knew in his heart that he was not going to be healed this side of eternity. He knew that it was over for him. And many times he tried to talk to his wife about his life, his mistakes, his regrets, his joys talk about their children. He wanted to talk to her about his dying, about his fears and his anticipation of seeing Jesus face to face. He wanted to talk to his wife about his desires for her and the family after he was gone. He wanted money issues to be discussed. I mean, all the things that we, a dying man would want to talk to his wife about, right? And she shut down all of those conversations in the name of that's a negative confession. We're not going to talk about that. There's power in the words we speak, so we're not going to talk about that. And today, it is one of her great regrets. She lives in the ache of those decisions that she never was able to have these conversations because of being idealistic. Think about the realities of a fallen world we live in. You could take this to the bank, that when you go through the fiery furnace of affliction, you will come through either purified or burned. The fiery furnace of affliction is called life. It's going to happen. Now, what those difficulties do to you really depends on your attitude. And I think a big, big factor is our willingness to live in this tension of both personal truth and transcendent truth. And if you're hearing me correctly, you should be thinking, boy, Barry, that sounds difficult to live in that tension of acknowledging personal truth and embracing and holding on to transcendent truth. And it is difficult. Trust me, it is not easy to squarely face adversity and affliction. Acknowledging what is real, both in your personal experience and embracing what is true, from a transcendent perspective. I mean, this is stuff, you guys, that is not for the faint of heart. It is not for weak-minded people. It is not for what, you know, Jesus referred to as those of little faith. Uh-uh. Nope. C.S. Lewis himself said this about the hard stuff of life. He said, reality looked at steadily is unbearable. Can I get an amen on that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 
facing your demons head on, not sticking your head in the sand, as many are prone to do, is not easy. It requires faith, the kind of faith, Brennan Manning called it, a ruthless trust in God, ferociously holding on to God's promises, to that transcendent truth that is unchanging, that applies to any and all who will apply it to their life. We ruthlessly trust God in the tough stuff of life. I mean, I've been at this for 45 years, gang, and I can tell you that I'm still on the learning curve. This is an attitude that takes a lifetime to learn, but I'm convinced it's so worth it in the end if we learn this. So, the benefits of living in known reality, it grounds us in wisdom, it fosters balance, and then number three <clears throat> is that it keeps us open and humble. It keeps us open and humble. A couple of minutes ago, I brought this to your attention about these uh, this three ideas about personal truth. Only one of the three could be true at a time. Our personal truth could be perceptionally true, but not really true. And I think we live there a lot, especially the part about not really true. We live there a lot. Trust me, I've lost thousands in $20 bets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we go for door number two more than we realize. And I don't know about you, but I've had my fair share of strongly held views, family, marriage, political views, theological views, everything. I mean, I'm usually not namby-pamby about uh, opinion on most anything. Views that I've firmly held on to, only later to have my eyes open and realize that I was actually just pig-headed, stubborn, and wrong. Has this ever happened to you? Men, you better have your hands up. You know, Jared, get your hands up, man. I mean, hey, this is what we do. And what this teaches us is that there are times when our present truth is not true. I'm not talking about transcendent truth. Those are always true. But regarding our personal truth, we've all had experiences where we look back and we see how narrow <laughs> and foolish our personal truth was. And so it's possible that our present truth may one day in the future be looked back on with a sense of narrowness and foolishness. Hopefully as we're growing, that will be the case. I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of things in your past that you've changed your mind on regarding a personal truth, I don't think that's ended. Five, ten years from now, things that are very true to you right now, you'll probably, some of them, be looking back and going, gee, I was an idiot. I mean, I do that a lot. <clears throat> I mean, my truth, especially with each new season of life, is where it tends to shift and to change. And so the point is this, that biblical Christ followers... You know, discerning between personal truth and, tr and uh, transcendent truth. I just think we need to be a lot more open and humble than we tend to be. And that our present and personal truth is not as rock solid as we have been inclined to see it. Paul says, whatever is true, think about these things. So three quick application points. Number one, <clears throat> I don't need to elaborate on these because I have been. Be discerning between your personal truth and your transcendent truth. Be discerning about that. Recognize that God wants you to have a personal truth. That's why he gives us eyes and ears and minds to see and perceive and comprehend things. And, and he expects us to use the information that in our personal truth that we take in. But we should never be confused about what's just my personal truth and what is that transcendent truth that stands true, that's beyond space and time, that's forever and ever unchanging. That's the stuff we build our life on. Number two, yield your personal truth to God's transcendent truth. You know, that when you realize that a personal truth that you've been holding on to doesn't square with a transcendent truth, 
you would do well to yield. You would do well to humbly acknowledge, hey, maybe God's smarter than me. Maybe God knows better than me. Maybe God has, is on to something here that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I, I wrote down some of the things just that uh, have changed in my life over the years where because I yielded my personal truth to transcendent truth. Some examples that I've done in my life is there was a time where my personal truth was, I don't need anybody. I could do my life on my own. I have switched that because there's a transcendent truth that speaks very clearly about the fact that God never intended us to live as islands, that we, in fact, do need one another. That's why I'm a big fan of small groups. That's why I'm a big fan of being connected, not trying to do your Christian life, you know, in some silo, in some, uh, you know, separated uh, uh, box-like setting. Uh, good luck on that. It will never work. So I, I, I've submitted the I don't need anyone personal truth to a transcendent truth of I was meant to be a part of family. Or here's another one of yielding is that, you know, I don't have anything to offer as a Christian. You know, and I, I, I quickly had to realize, okay, well, God says I've got a gift. God says I've got abilities. God says I've got talent. And I can tell you, in the world of church life, I've done everything from washing, scrubbing toilets to pastoring a church and quite literally everything in between. Uh, you know, because I have some gifts. I have some ability, and so do you. Um, here's another where I had to change my personal truth to God's transcendent truth is there was a time where I viewed my money as my money. It's funny how, though, I could never hold on to my money as long as it was my money. It just seemed to evaporate and disappear. And then when I realized, okay, there's a transcendent truth that everything belongs to God and he's just allowed me to be a steward of these things and he gave me guidelines of how to steward money, you know, I, I made a switch there. I yielded my, my money is my money to now, now it's all God's and I'm just a simple steward of how that money is to be managed. So that's the idea there. Yield your personal truth to God's transcendent truth. And then number three, avoid becoming dogmatic with your personal truth. Again, I have been wrong so many times. I'm actually pretty good at this one, you know. I realize that the odds are I'm going to be wrong. And so when I'm speaking from something out of a personal truth, I usually preface it with, you know what, I could be wrong. And I'm very sincere about that because historical evidence supports that. <laughs> I, I'm, I could be wrong on this. And then by contrast, and I didn't make this a point, but if it's a transcendent truth, those are hills that I am prepared to die on. Those are hills that will never waver in my thinking. That will never go, I, you know, I have moments of arrogance, but I just thank goodness, you know. I'm not so arrogant as to think that my wisdom supersedes God's. <laughs> so, chill regarding your personal truth, you know? Because chances are you're like me. It may be wrong. So, Father, I think about attitude as we approach this new year and we look at this subject of whatever is true, think about these things. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of alethes. We would be mindful of living our lives in the light of known reality, both our personal truth and our transcendent truth. Father, would you help us to be words, uh, to speak words of encouragement, to be speaking words of life to one another. Would you help us, Lord, to, as we walk in the light of your truth, that we would reflect well your love, because ultimately that's the point. Thanks so much for being kind to us. Thank you for these marvelous transcendent truths that we can build our lives upon. And we affirm one of those, Lord, that you are good. You are good. We're grateful for that. Amen.